This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I apologize. I um, didn't hit the record button, but yeah, we're we're talking about hand hygiene, where we have hand washing, um, using the antiseptic hand rub or surgical hand antisepsis. Um, so key concepts, hands contaminated with transient bacteria pose significant risk for transmission of infection. Hands with dermatitis or other skin breakdown are more susceptible to becoming colonized with transient bacteria, including multidrug resistant organisms. Now, this is a very important key concept because you should have a good relationship with your employee health um, clinic or your employee health department. There are times when some of our staff have reactions to the type of hand products that we use. Um, most recently, I had a traveler who was with us that was just reacting very poorly to the foam that we have, um, and his hands, like his entire hands were peeling. I mean, it was like just, his the skin was just like sloughing off. It was, it was pretty intense. And, and so making sure that you have that relationship with your employee health so that you can get them the resources that they need, whether it's switching from a foam to a gel or trying to find something that works for that team member is extremely, extremely important because you can see that hands with all sorts of issues or skin breakdown are more susceptible to becoming colonized with transient bacteria, including those multidrug resistant organisms. Healthcare personnel adherence to hand hygiene recommendations must be monitored and feedback given. Now, for those of you who are there, is there anybody on the line who participates uh, with LeapFrog? Are they part of LeapFrog? Yes, we do that here at Loma Linda. Yeah, yeah. So LeapFrog um, has become really, really strict about hand hygiene monitoring. So you have to have a minimum of 200 observations per unit per month, and there are some there are some uh, some units or some areas where they may need less of the 200. Um, so for example, if you have like a very small NICU where your census doesn't go over you know six or five per day or something like that, where you might be able to have 100 to 150 observations, it really depends. They help you account for the volume that you're seeing in each unit, but it's it, hand hygiene monitoring is very, very, very important. Um, and not just for LeapFrog, but in general. Personally, I feel though sometimes you need to have the, that push from either regulatory or from other um, LeapFrog or other just other things that the executive teams value because it really helps you push for um, higher adherence of hand hygiene because then they have that buy-in for for making sure that they're doing the right thing. Uh, healthcare personnel need to be educated about when and how to perform hand hygiene. Patients should be offered the opportunity to clean their hands during the day and should be encouraged to participate in their care by either reminding staff to clean their hands or by providing positive reinforcement for hand hygiene compliance. And that's part of how you determine how you monitor hand hygiene. So lots of different places do it differently. I was actually having a conversation with one of my colleagues um, over the weekend and <laughs> yeah we talk about hand hygiene I know it's, it's, it's so exciting. <laughs> we were talking about the different methods um, for for our facilities and we were comparing and he was like oh well our IP department really doesn't have anything to do with hand hygiene like it's all quality. Quality manages everything to do with hand hygiene. They share the data with us, but we don't we don't have ownership of that, which is obviously very different from my facility, whereas infection prevention, like we manage all of the data, like um, you know, the papers that nurses turn into us, all of that data entry is done by us. The education for hand hygiene champions, that is also done by us. And so it's just really interesting to see all, the way that different facilities manage this. And so just make sure that you understand what their recommendations are about performing those observations, giving that feedback. It's all very, it's very important. Okay, hand hygiene has been accepted as the single most important measure to prevent the transmission of infectious organisms. And you should be ensuring that your units and your departments are staying up to date with what their rates are. So here at our campus, we have this thing called Foam at Fridays. <laughs> 
<laughs> Moment Fridays, where we send out an email to let them know where they are every Friday. They know exactly how many observations their unit has, the percentage that they're at, um, so that you know the hand hygiene champions and so leaders can be aware of how everyone is doing. Key players in hand hygiene guidance are obviously going to be our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, the Joint Commission. Um, all of these people have lots of resources when it comes to hand hygiene. So what are some of our reasons for poor adherence to hand hygiene? Uh, one is going to be lack of knowledge. Increased demands with less time. I think that's a very big portion of it. So making sure that you're taking a look at what your staffing, what your staffing looks like. Um, our organization recently went from our PCTs being assigned 15 to 18 patients down to 10. So um, that was a really big push for like basically to, to make sure that we could improve our staffing for our patient care technicians. Um, at some other facilities, you may, you may refer to them as CNAs, um, but that, that really does help because, you know, they're able to try to get more work done with less of a patient load. Um, lack of soap and paper towels, inaccessible sinks, a shortage of sinks, um, the belief that wearing gloves replaces the need for hand hygiene. This is a big one. The belief that wearing gloves replaces the need for hand hygiene is a huge, huge issue within healthcare facilities. Um, lack of role models, lack of administrative priority for hand hygiene. Um, oh, wait, this is my emergency department calling. Give me one second. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just making sure we don't have anything urgent going on down there. Um, so belief that um, belief that wearing gloves is very important. Lack of role models, lack of administrative priorities for hand hygiene, um, and lack of administrative sanctions. All right. So hand hygiene. Ah, oh, darn, darn. It was exactly what I thought it was. Okay. Uh, give me, guys. I'm so sorry. I have a, I have, I have an urgent situation in my emergency department. If you can please just give me, you know, two minutes. Let's take a quick break. I, I might have to hop off. Let me, let me make a quick phone call. I do, I do apologize. Please take your time. Yes.
Hey, y'all. Can somebody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> I have a question. This is my first time getting on and listening. But what book is she talking about that we could read from? Is that off of APIC or is there a particular book? Yeah, it's an APIC book. It's um, titled Certification Study Guide. And the latest edition is the sixth edition. Um, it has um, about 10 chapters uh, with questions and answers and explanations. And then at the end, it has like three practice exams that help you like envision how how the exam would like look lo like and how they structure the questions she okay. referred to that in the first very first lecture so if you pull it off youtube you may be able to listen to her explanation about that book but it's a great book hey guys okay. i'm back thank you hello can you guys hear me yes Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so um, yes, so the book, that's the study guide where you can take the questions, but the APIC text of infection control, which they they have online, you have to purchase access through it. Or if you're a large enough health system, like for example, for our health system, it is purchased through our library. And so, um, and so you're able to get on, you know, the, the library and access it through your health system that, it really depends on your on your hospital system, but it is really truly a text that every infection preventionist should have access to. So hand hygiene and gloves. Gloves do not replace the need for hand hygiene. Hand hygiene should always be performed before putting gloves on and always be performed after removing your gloves. And so this is one of the biggest things that we teach our hand hygiene champions during their hand hygiene class. Because one of the biggest opportunities that I personally notice when I'm out rounding or when I'm spending time in patient rooms doing, you know, uh, either central line rounds or Foley rounds or whatever it is that we're doing out on the unit is that a lot of people feel very comfortable putting on a pair of gloves and not cleaning their hands before they do it. The other thing that they feel really comfortable with is taking off gloves and then putting on a new pair of gloves. Super, it's just they're very comfortable with it. And this is one of the biggest things that we have to try to get our staff out of the habit of doing. Um, remembering how important it is to make sure that their hands are clean before they, before they grab those gloves and that they perform hand hygiene after. Um, and then this is one of the images from CDC. So what is the CDC's preferred method for hand hygiene in healthcare facilities? Um, a is soap and water and B is alcohol-based hand, hand, hand rub or hand sanitizer. So you can go ahead and put your answer in the chat. Okay, we've got mo both answer choices that were selected. Both people, people have chosen both A and B. Okay, and the correct answer is actually B. So the preferred method for hand hygiene um, in healthcare facilities is the use of an alcohol-based hand rub. Um, and this changed, this guidance changed back in 2002. One of the things that I, I really hope CDC does is like soon, because <laughs> it is 2022, um, is update their hand hygiene guidelines. Um, because I think that there enough time has passed to where we we need an update to this document. I mean, it's still the document that most of us are referred referring to when putting trainings together. But like, help a sister out. Like, let's go. Like, let's update these guidelines. Um, make sure that we have you know information on 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 everything that revolves hand hygiene. Um, and so in 2002, the guidelines really point towards the promotion of the use of alcohol-based hand sanitizers as a primary way for healthcare personnel to decontaminate their hands. Alcohol-based hand sanitizer um, is more effective and less drying than using soap and water. Um, 
compared to soap and water, alcohol-based hand sanitizers are better at reducing bacterial counts on hands and are effective against multi-drug resistant organisms. Additionally, alcohol-based hand sanitizers cause less skin irritation and than frequent use of soap and water. So it's more effective, it's less drying, you got bad germs, you got good germs. With the alcohol-based um, hand rub, and I know, so most people refer to it as hand sanitizer. I'm just using the term that they use in the text. Um, so alcohol-based hand rub, or ABHR, is an alcohol-containing preparation designed for application to the hands for reducing the number of viable organisms on the hands. It can contain 60 to 95 percent ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. Um, isopropyl alcohol has a slighter, greater activity against bac bacteria, and ethyl alcohol has a greater activity against viruses. Because hand dryness is a frequent cited reason for non-compliance with hand hygiene, the CDC guidelines recommend hand lotions or creams be provided to healthcare personnel to minimize the occurrence of irritant contact dermatitis associated with hand antisepsis or hand washing. And this is really important because as an IP, you really want to make sure that the hand lotions that our staff are using, that the components of those lotions do not inactivate any of those antimicrobials. So so um, we use Ecolab. There's lots of different brands that you can use, but Ecolab has a hand lotion that's compatible with what they use. And one of the things that I like to give away, like playing games during orientation, um, is that Eco, like it's a smaller bottle um, of Ecolab hand lotion out to our staff because it's really important to give them access to lotion that can make sure that their hands stay moisturized and that is compatible with the soap that you are using at your facility. Um, so yeah, because I know a lot of the time sometimes you'll see sometimes you'll see like Bath and Body Works and all sorts of other lotions out there. So I mean if they don't have lotion accessible, what are you expecting them to use, right? So it's really important that you that you try to make that um, a priority for your for your facility. I remember there was a point in time when they were talking about, oh, well, we need to get rid of the lotions. And I was like, absolutely not, absolutely not. We have the lotions for a reason and we gotta keep them, okay? They can't, they can't go because I don't know if you've tried, you know, doing hand hygiene like five bajillion times in a day, but your hands get dry. Um, the WHO How to Hand Rub with Alcohol-Based Formulation. This is one of my favorite videos, which really shows you how to perform thorough hand hygiene. We're not going to watch it now, um, but let me see if I can post the link in the chat. No, no, it's okay. Just, just look this up on YouTube because I'm going to mess up my whole situation here. I already know it. I already struggle so much with just getting this up and going, so um, it's great. Okay, which agency? regulates antiseptic agents. Which agency regulates antiseptic agents? A, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention guidelines, B, the World Health Organization, C, the Joint Commission, or D, the Food and Drug Administration? And put your answer in the chat. Okay, so we've got everyone put D. Oh my goodness. You guys are amazing. <laughs> That's so good. Okay, so the Food and Drug Administration. Rationale, antiseptic agents are antimicrobial substances that are applied to the skin to reduce the number of microbial flora. Examples include alcohols, chlor alcohols, chlorhexidine, chlorine, hexachlorophene, iodine, chloroxanolinol, coronary ammonium compounds, and triclosan. In the United States, the Food and Drug Administration regulates antiseptic agents, so the FDA. Okay, soap and water. So we now know that um, the use of a hand sanitizer or an alcohol-based hand rub is the preferred method for hand hygiene in healthcare facilities. The important thing is that the method that you use for hand hygiene is really going to depend on what's going on with that patient and what activities you're gonna be doing. Because obviously, the hand sanitizer is the preferred, but 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 there are going to be times when you should be wash, wash, washing your hands with soap and water. So when to use soap and water? Use it when your hands are visibly dirty, contaminated, or soiled. And visibly soiled hands are hands that show visible dirt or that are visibly contaminated with proteinaceous material, blood, or other body fluids like fecal material or urine. 
Other opportunities include after using the restroom, before you're preparing or eating food, when caring for a patient with a GI illness and spore-forming organisms. So obviously our C. diff patients, our norovirus patients, we're really gonna wanna make sure that we use that soap and water. And then you wet your hands and apply soap and water for at least 15 to 20 seconds. We're not gonna fight over the 15 to 20 seconds. CDC has both 15 as a minimum and 20 as a minimum. So it's 15 to 20 seconds and somewhere in there. Um, and then rinse and dry with a disposable towel. So there have been so many times when I have seen people wash their hands and then just grab the handle and close the water. And I'm like, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? Let's talk about it. Like, let's debrief. I know this just happened, but let's let's talk about it, right? Um, we have, and and you know, the other thing is that the air dryers, but anyway, let me not get into this. You see, this is what happens. I'm like, I have like little squirrels up in my brain. I start thinking about the paper towels and then the automatic hand dryers. And then here I am just, just going with it. Um, but yes, so when you're washing your hands, after you're done, you wanna make sure that you use a paper towel to dry them and then to also close the faucet. Wet hands have the ability of picking up a lot more microbes than dry ones. And you also don't wanna to touch, you know, the, the hand uh, the hand fa uh, faucet thingy that's been contaminated, um, the water handle situation there. Um, so if you have a dry apple and a wet apple and you drop both of the apples into the dirt, which apple is going to pick up more dirt? The wet one, right? Your hands are the same way. It gives that the bacteria the opportunity to just latch on, hop onto those hands, and have a party. So please make sure you're using paper towels, okay? Alcohol-based hand rub, apply um, to the palms of your hands. And this is important, your manufacturer is actually going to instruct and tell you how much of it you should use, how much of that hand sanitizer you should be using. Um, it will be dependent on the manufacturer. You know, they have different descriptions of how much you need. And so please make sure that you know what your manufacturer, um, what the expectations are for your manufacturer. Okay, true or false? Healthcare personnel who wear artificial nails are more likely to harbor gram-negative bacteria on their fingertips than are those who have natural nails, both before and after hand washing. True, this is true. Oh, fingernails and artificial nails. I have these little gloves with artificial nails that I always wear during um, new member orientation um, because I really talk to them a lot about nails during orientation, during IP orientation, um, so that they can really understand how important nails are in healthcare. So studies have documented that subungual areas of the hand harbor high concentrations of bacteria. Freshly applied nail polish does not increase the number of bacteria recovered from periungal skin, but chipped nail polish may support the growth of large numbers of organisms on fingernails, even after careful hand washing or the use of surgical scrubs. Personnel often harbor substantial numbers of potential pathogens in the subungual spaces. And so, I talk to them about the importance of making sure that their nails are, um, you know, that they're short, that they are kept trimmed, the importance of not having chipped nail polish because these are all like little giant crevices for bacteria to live in and to cling on to. Um, these pointy ones, which I believe these might be the stilettos or maybe the coffin shaped ones, they have, guys, they actually have different shapes. Okay, um, these can cause skin tears. Like let's, yes, obviously Pseudomonas and E. coli can live under them, but they can also like really hurt our patients. Um, and so I try to, I try to remind them. The other thing that I recommend that you do is you, that you talk to them about studies that have been published. So um, in the CDC guidelines, they talk about a study that was done with Pseudomonas aeruginosa in NICUs. Okay, that made babies sick. And another study that I really like is one that was done um, out in California back in 1994 surrounding open hearts and serratia, post-op, post-operative serratia um, infections in cabbage patients, like open heart patients. They kept having um, 
serratia growing in, on their incisions and it was traced back to um, scrub the scrub nurse and it was in her emollient like cream from her house when they got rid of the, when they got rid of the cream and the nails it was done the outbreak was over but one of the patients died and so providing staff with information is really important so that they can um, so that they can make those informed decisions so they so that they understand that it's not coming from a bad place the the type of you know guidelines that we're trying to offer them and why we're why we're strict on nails right all right let's do the five moments for hand hygiene by the world health organization so what is moment number one what is moment number one so the little dotted line depicts us heading into the patient environment so moment number one good job Maria yes before touching the patient what about moment number two moment number two good job Zenith yes before a clean or aseptic procedure moment number three we can see the little Foley, right? <laughs> There's a Foley catheter, so that should give you a clue. Okay, okay, good. Maria, you're doing good, yes. After body fluid exposure risk. Number four, so we see the little line here. Yeah, after touching the patient. And then number five, we see our, all of our belongings there, all of the patient belongings. So after touching the patient surroundings, I, I do this, this little exercise during orientation as well. And then I give them food vouchers for the people who answer them right. Because <laughs> I, I try to make it fun. I also have costumes that I wear <laughs> for, for orientation. Um, and so it's orientation is a very exciting time for me. I love doing new employee orientation. It's a, it's a whole show, okay? It's a whole theatrical situation for me because I want to make it fun and engaging and so that they remember they remember the lady with the nails and the jellyfish hat and the poop emoji hat, okay? Um, all right, so improving hand hygiene adherence. Education alone seldom leads to adequate adherence to hand hygiene in healthcare. Multimodal, multidisciplinary um, strategies are more likely to lead to change and improve hand hygiene practices. Factors related to hand hygiene improvement include administrative support, convenient and acceptable products and dispensers, monitoring and feedback, um, role modeling of excellent hand hygiene practices, and motivational or incentive programs. In addition, the behavioral and motivational components of hand hygiene adherence are receiving more attention as it becomes clearer that these have a profound impact on practice. And behavioral health is one of the things that we have to focus on and that we have to know um, as infection preventionists. A portion of your test is going to include you knowing different types of behavioral interventional strategies like um, behavioral models, behavioral models of health, um, making sure that you know um, the, what, the trans theoretical model, the health belief model, there's all of these different models that they are expecting for you to know. Um, okay, so monitoring, adherence, okay. This is this is just not today is just not my day. Today is just not my day. Acceptable methods for measuring hand hygiene adherence. Um, so directly observe a sample of hand hygiene opportunities and calculate the rate of adherence. So the number of hand hygiene episodes performed divided by the number of hand hygiene opportunities by ward or service. Some organization use the WHO's five moments for hand hygiene um, in and out moments. Um, they assess the quality of hand hygiene adherence, so that time spent per hand hygiene episode and whether soap was used. Again, we monitor the volume of specific hand hygiene products and, okay, and monitoring adherence, this slide specifically is important for you to know because they can ask you questions like, which of the following are methods that are recommended or approved for the monitoring of hand hygiene adherence? And, okay, I'm sorry, please give me one second. Okay, um, and so you need to make sure that you know how they need to be monitored.
minutes. Okay. I'm by myself today, guys, so just bear with me. <laughs> um, okay, uh, employ a system of video monitoring or use of sensing devices that have been validated to monitor hand hygiene episodes per patient care episode. All right, this is a CDC interactive web-based education program. Um, how long should you rub your hands together when applying alcohol-based hand rub? This is one of your options um, that you can go to. These are some of the supplemental resources, uh, different resources that you can look at, that you can read over. Um, the, I think the biggest thing for hand hygiene is making sure that you're trying to do your best for it to be an emphasis in your facility and that you have multiple people involved in trying to, to improve hand hygiene on the facility. Because for some, for some IPs, they are, there's, it is only one person for at times like up to 300 beds. And so you really can't expect for, for the entire shift in a culture to happen solely involve, involving infection prevention. That's why when, you know, I first came to my facility, the, the only people collecting hand hygiene information were the IPs. And I was like, well, I'm not sure how impactful this is really going to be because number one, the Hawthorne effect, but number two, our facility needs to be involved. Our frontline team needs to be involved. Our leaders need to be involved, um, making sure that they're really understanding what's going on on in the facility so that we can have an impact in shifting our culture. All right, isolation precautions. Several classes of pathogens can cause infection, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites, and um, prions. So modes of, transmission, modes of transmission include both direct or indirect contact, um, droplet, as well as airborne, which we are all familiar with. So key concepts, the risk of transmission of infectious agents occurs in all healthcare settings, including acute care facilities, long-term care settings, ambulatory care facilities, and home health care. Doesn't matter where you are in the healthcare spectrum, um, infection prevention is involved, right? And I think over the next couple of years, we're gonna see a lot of expansion of infection prevention into areas outside of just healthcare. But obviously for our tests, we're focusing specifically on healthcare. Infections can be transmitted from patient to patient via healthcare personnel, the shared environment or medical equipment and devices. Unidentified patients who are colonized or infected with infectious agents represent a risk to other patients and healthcare personnel. So um, some fundamental elements, Fund fundamental elements needed to prevent transmission of infectious agents includes a comprehensive educational program on the isolation precaution system that must include medical staff or faculty, staff, patients, and visitors, um, administrative support, adequate infection prevention staffing, and this is a whole other topic right here, adequate infection prevention staffing, like can we talk about that? Mm, because there's a lot of discussions that we can have about adequate infection prevention staffing, internal communication, as well as external communication. These are examples of what the transmission-based precautions may look like. Um, obviously, it depends on the facility. Um, some facilities have different signs that they use, different colors that they use. Uh, so for example, ours are not orange, our contact is yellow. And so it, it depends on your facility. So contact precautions, this is contact precautions with special enteric. So this is emphasizing the need to use soap and water. Droplet precautions, as well as airborne infection isolation precautions. So with standard precautions, um, they should be applied to all patients. You must treat all blood or bodily fluids as if they are infectious material. It includes hand hygiene, the use of gloves, gowns, masks, eye protection, or face shields, depending on the associated exposure. Contact precautions, which are used for diseases transmitted by contact with the patient or the patient's environment. Um, so single room is preferred, is preferred. I know some of you have uh still have um rooms that you have like that patients share like two to a room so if 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 you if you can't share that single room then try to cohort patients 
cohort patients with the same disease or organism, right? So patients with the same disease or organism may share a room. Personal protective equipment, so gowns and gloves. The transport, limit patient transport outside of the room only for medically necessary purposes. Cover or contain potentially infectious body fluids before that transport. And then discontinuation, when signs and symptoms of the infection have resolved or according to pathogen-specific recommendations. And your discontinuation practices are going to depend on what your specific facility policies um, recommend. So, for example, for discontinuation of MRSA, your facility may require for that wound to be, you know, re-swabbed or for you to do um, a nasal PCR, right? Depending on VRE, it may require, you know, a subsequent rectal swab. It, it really depends on what your policies are showing um, and what those, you know, what those discontinuation recommendations are going to be. So for contact precautions, one of the things that sometimes bother me a little bit with precaution signs is that I think that they should be as simple as possible. And so the order on the sign should mimic what our recommendations are. And so for our contact precautions, you want to make sure you do hand hygiene, you put your gown on, and then you put on your gloves. Um, but as you can see, the, the, the order of it on the actual sign is a little bit, it's backwards. Um, and so I think you need to make it, you, you need to make it as simple as possible to for people, like for people, I remember when I was younger, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't even pursuing like public health at the time. One of my friends was in the hospital and he had, um, he had a wound with MRSA in it. And I remember I just like was excited to go see him and make sure that he was okay. And I'm walking in and, and, you know, the nurse is like, no, 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 no. Like, you can't go in there. You have to make sure that, you know, you, you got to read the sign and you got to put all this stuff on. And I was like, oh my goodness, because and and I get it. I understand, you know, when, when you're having those discussions with family members and they're like, oh, I had no idea. Like people really, for us who do this every day and all of the time, yeah, we absolutely get it. You look at the sign on the door, you make sure you're doing the right thing. But, you know, think about some of your other team members, people who may be new, right? PCTs who may not have any experience having been a PCT anywhere else, our nutritional services who may not have ever worked at a healthcare facility before. And so making sure that we provide that education, that they understand the importance of the science and our, as well as our visitors on why it's important. Um, it's, yeah, it's very important. Now, are you gonna have some feisty people? Yes. Yes, you, you can have some feisty people who, <laughs> who may be like, well, you can call security on me because I'm not wearing anything. <laughs> but um, those are far and few in between. So just, just try to make sure that you do your best at educating. All right, with for our droplet precautions, um, these are going to be to prevent the, the, the transmission of diseases caused by large respiratory droplets that are generated by coughing, sneezing, or talking. A single room is preferred but patients with the same disease or organism may share a room. Priority should be given to patients with excessive sputum production, and patients must be spatially separated by six feet. Our personal protective equipment is going to be a surgical mask. Make sure that you handle items with con contaminated with respiratory secretions um, with gloves. Patient transport, limit patient transport outside of the room only for medically necessary purposes. If the patient must leave, they need to wear a surgical mask. Discontinuation, when signs and symptoms of the infection have resolved or according to pathogen-specific recommendations. Droplet precautions, exciting times, right? Oh my goodness. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're wearing our masks, okay? You have, I really like, there. I love this course, okay? I always recommend it to people. And it's the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Infection Prevention in Nursing Homes through Coursera, it is free. It is hilarious, okay? They have an entire novella, okay? They have an entire soap opera. It's called Gloves and Gowns, okay? And it is fantastic. <laughs> they talk to you about isolation precautions. There's all of this drama. There's a grandma involved, an estranged granddaughter who may or may not be her nurse. Like, it, it is this whole situation. Um, and this is one of the images that they have in that training where they talk about one to three, um, one to three feet, three to six feet for those large and small droplets. And then you're obviously your droplet nuclei for airborne. 
So droplet precautions, make sure you do your hand hygiene and that you wear your mask. We are still doing universal um, masking precautions at our facility. All right, let's do some statements. So are the following statements true or false? So the first one is, you should use a face mask during a lumbar puncture procedure to prevent oral contamination. Is that true or false? Okay, so we have lots of trues. Good. The next one, respiratory hygiene means ensuring that you use the alcohol-based hand rub after coughing into your hands in order to get rid of the pathogens. Is this true or false? Respiratory hygiene. Respiratory hygiene. Okay. Respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette includes, includes covering the mouth and nose during coughing and sneezing with a tissue or offering a mask to the coughing patient, not into your hands, discarding the mask or tissue appropriately and performing hand hygiene, posting signs in public areas in languages appropriate to the population served and educating healthcare personnel, patients, and visitors. So I like, I like this little graph, the dab, you know, back in the day, you know, dabbing was like a thing. Um, but I think it's a really cute and fun way of trying to help people to destroy all bacteria. You got a dab. Okay. Now we're moving into our airborne precautions. So airborne precautions are to prevent the transmission of infectious organisms that remain suspended in the air and travel great distances due to their small size. So airborne infection isolation, um, negative air pressure room relative to the corridor, and it, le and it needs at least six to 12 air exchanges per hour and air should be exhausted to the outside. Make sure you keep the door shut. If you don't keep the door shut, depending on your alarm system, it's going to start beeping, telling you like, hey, I can't do my job because you won't close the door. Um, our personal protective equipment is going to be a NIOSH approved N95 or higher. Patient transport, limit patient transport outside of the room. If the patient must leave, they need to wear a surgical mask. Do not place an N95 on the patient as this may further hinder their ability to breathe given their compromised respiratory status. Transport staff do not need to wear respiratory protection during transport if the patient is masked and all skin lesions are covered. Immunocompromised and pregnant healthcare personnel should be restricted from these patients. So what is a protective environment? A protective environment is recommended for allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients to reduce the risk of invasive environmental fungal infections and other opportunistic infections. So some of our environmental controls are going to be filtering that incoming air with a HEPA filtration that is positive pressure with relation to the corridor at 12, 12 air exchanges per hour. And some environment, environmental measures also include cleaning the rooms with techniques that minimize that dust dispersal. And let me tell you, dust is real. Dust is real. How many of you still have blinds? Like the blinds, um, you know, the, the ones that are like uh, horizontal, those horizontal blinds in your, in your rooms? Those are so hard to clean and they gather so much dust so much dust. Um, I, I'm, on a, I'm on a campaign, okay, trying to get rid of those here um, in some of our older, in some of our older rooms because they're just so difficult to clean. Um, avoid upholstered furnishings, wet dust horizontal surfaces, and then prohibit dried and fresh flowers or potted plants. Now, the fresh flowers and, and potted plants are Definitely an opportunity there because what do people want to do when people are sick in the hospital? They want to bring them flowers or send them flowers. It's a thing. And so making sure that we're keeping those, um, you know, fresh flowers away from our immunocompromised patients. You know, if you have oncology units, if you have uh, critical care units, burn units, um, that's one of the things that you should be monitoring for and that your staff should be aware of. 
Um, so I have a little hat that's, as you guys know, I'm ridiculous. And so I have a hat that I made that's like has all of these little fake flowers on them and it says no flowers. And it's my little hat that I wear when I go out and educate the nurses on not having flowers for our immunocompromised patients in the ICU and oncology. And I talk to them about aspergillosis and all of the different other types of infections that you know can be related to to, to flowers, because they, people don't know. And that's the thing. That's that's the fun part about our job is that we get to educate. We get to teach people about about things that they would have never even thought were a risk, right? Um, during periods of construction, I place an N95 respirator on the patient who can medically tolerate it. Okay, so what about airborne precautions in the protective environment? Uh, so an anteroom must be present. Positive air pressure needs to be maintained in relation to the anteroom. Air in the anteroom needs to be filtered with a portable HEPA filtration unit. If an anteroom is not available, place the patient in an airborne isolation room, not the protective environment, and use a portable HEPA filter, HEPA unit to filter the air inside the patient room for fungal spores. All right, so let's do some matching. So at the top, you have the different types of isolation, and then you've got your diseases over here. So let's start with variola major. Variola major. Well, what is variola major, right? Because as soon as you know what it is, you're going to know what type of isolation. What is variola major? Good job, Sini. Smallpox. What about Neisseria meningitidis? What, what would I use for Neisseria meningitidis? Droplet. All right, what about influenza? Rapid fire, because we're running out of time. Good job, droplet. What about vancomycin resistant enterococci? VRE. Yes, good job, contact. MRSA, MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, contact. Clostridioides difficile. I like, I like it. So a lot of people are saying contact and then a lot of people are saying enteric contact. Good job. What about Bordetella pertussis? Bordetella pertussis. Droplet, very good. Rhinovirus. Droplet measles. Measles. All right, TB. And SARS, airborne. Okay, excellent. Um, let's skip over this true or false because I feel like we just need to try to get some questions done. All right, question one Which process is defined as the process of preventing contact with microbes? A, sterilization. B, cleaning, C, asepsis, and D, disinfection. All right, great job for those who put asepsis. Aseptic technique is the process of carrying out activities that will maintain objects and areas free of microbes to the greatest extent possible. This involves using sterile drapes and clothing to maintain sterility of instruments during surgical procedures and using sterile gloves and sterile dressings for at least 24 hours after surgery. Question two, a patient has been admitted with a diagnosis of suspected West Nile fever. Could a West Nile virus? West Nile virus is also a lot of fun to learn about, but Let's continue. The doctor has not ordered any isolation precautions. What precautions should be used with this patient? A, standard precautions, B, no precautions, C, contact precautions, and D, airborne precautions. West Nile. How do we get West Nile? I don't know if, if this little animal makes a sound, but because I feel like that's more of a B. <laughs> okay, guys, do not think that this comes from bees just because I did that, okay? 
because it's mosquitoes. <laughs> it's mosquitoes. Okay, so standard precaution. Um, West Nile virus is an arthropod-borne virus, okay? Most commonly spread by infected mosquitoes. West Nile virus can cause febrile illness, encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, or meningitis, inflammation of the meninges. West Nile virus has been spread through blood transfusions, organ transplants, and from mother to baby during pregnancy, delivery, or breastfeeding. And standard precautions should be used used okay i tell you this time and time again on this test they want to know do you know how you get this disease the transmission and what the isolation is you've got to know this stuff all right question three a patient is admitted with suspected ebola virus disease which of the following isolation preca precautions are required one is standard, two is contact, three is airborne, and four is droplet. And there is a magical combination that is the um, that is the right answer. So what's our magical combination here? Okay, so the people are voting, but the people are not in agreement. <laughs> I have A's, C's, D's. Okay, I think the Ds are winning. The Ds are winning. Good job. One, two, and four. So that's going to be standard contact and droplet. So Ebola virus disease is a severe, often fatal disease in humans and non-human primates. Ebola is caused by infection with a virus of the family Filviridae, genus Ebola virus. Standard contact and droplet precautions are recommended for management of hospitalized patients with known or suspected Ebola hemorrhagic fever. Um, so this is talking to you about, you know, thank Ebola and try to recognize that early. So, you know, you're, you're assessing your patient for any type of international travel or a contact with someone with Ebola within the last 21 days, seeing if they've had a fever at home or if they currently have a fever. And then you're going to be looking for other symptoms such as severe headaches, muscle pains, weakness, fatigue, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, or an unexplained hemorrhage or bleeding or bruising. If the patient has had both exposures and symptoms, immediately isolate the patient and inform others. All right, question four. A patient is admitted with suspected Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, or MERS. Which of the following isolation precautions are required? One, standard. Two, contact. Three, airborne. And four, droplet. Okay, lots of different answers again. Um, I can't, okay, so I have A, B, C, and D. Everyone selected every single answer. Okay, so the correct answer is one, two, and three, standard contact in airborne. Middle East Respiratory Syndrome is an illness caused by a coronavirus called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. Most MERS patients develop severe acute respiratory illness with symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. The mortality rate is approximately 30%. Health officials first reported the disease in Saudi Arabia in September of 2012. So far, all cases of MERS have been linked to countries in and near the Arabian Peninsula. Standard contact and airborne precautions are recommended for management of hospitalized patients with known or suspected MERS. All right, um, last question. A patient was recently diagnosed with C. diff infection of the colon. You are called to institute contact precautions and you do all of the following except, one, gloves and gowns are required before entry. Two, the patient is limited in movement outside of the room except when absolutely medically necessary. Three, you move the patient to a single room. And four, the patient is moved to a negative pressure room to avoid airborne fomite exposure. Okay, everybody put four. Good job. All right, this is the last one, I promise. Question six, which of the following transmission-based precaution categories require a negative airflow room? A is contact, B is airborne, C is droplet, and D is standard. Everybody put B, 10 out of 10. All right, guys, that is it for today. All right, so next week, last time I did this class, I focused mostly on chapter 63 and 68, which is ophthalmology services and surgical services. 
Next week, we're going to focus on respiratory care services. And um, our meeting is going to be have to be moved up to Tuesday next week. Um, I finally was able to get some stuff sorted out on Google, so I will work on sending out an email. Um, I know Tuesday is not our usual meeting day, but there's going to be a couple of things happening this month of June on Fridays, um, you know, including travel. There's obviously the APIC conference is coming up. There's lots of things that are coming up. So just look forward to that. And obviously, I will get this posted on YouTube as soon as I can. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And remember, next week, we're going to cover respiratory care services. So chapter 67. And then I might sprinkle some questions on ophthalmology services. Okay. All right. I got to go. I have to go to another meeting, but thank you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend and your holiday. Bye-bye. Girl, today's been crazy. I got...